the subject of this lecture is work and energy. In physics, work is defined as the force applied on an object, and as a result of that, the object is moving a certain distance. It is displacing a certain distance. And so the product of this applied force and the distance of displacement is known as work. So the definition is very specific and it's completely different than the typical understanding of what work is from everyday life. Our considerations uh, on this subject will involve the uh, understanding of how forces and displacements are taken into account to calculate work done on an object. And so here is a simple example. A person is pushing on a car and they are applying a force F. As a result, the car is moving and it displaces a certain distance S. And so we take the product of the force and the displacement and that is the work done by the person on the car. The units for work are the product of units of force and the units of distance, so that would be Newton meters. However, as it turns out, there is a relationship between work done by a force and change in energy, which we will discuss later. And for energy, the units that are used are joules, so therefore it is convenient to use the units of joules for work as well. Another reason for this choice of units is because when we talk about rotational motion and torque more specifically, torque also has units of newtons times meters. And so to avoid confusion by the units for work, we are always going to use joules as the units. In this example here, Notice that the vectors, the force vector and the displacement vector, both are parallel to each other and they point in the same direction. So in a later slide, I will talk about the angle dependence between the force and the displacement and how that factors in into the calculation of the work done by the force. Here is a table with the units for force distance and work in the three uh, measurement systems. The, met the metric system, SI. As I already said, newtons are force, meters for, me uh, for distance. The work is measured in joules. In the older centigram gram seconds uh, measurement system, force is measured in dynes, distance in centimeters, work in er ergs. And in the imperial system, we have pounds for force, feet for distance, and then work is measured in foot pounds. So as I mentioned, there is an angle dependence between the direction of the force vector and the displacement vector. And here is an example where this angle dependence comes into play. So we have a person here pulling on a piece of luggage. And so the force that's applied, F, is directed at some angle theta with respect to the horizontal. And therefore, that is also the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector. So then, since the luggage is moving horizontally, that means that only part of this force F is going to actually make the luggage move and therefore do work on the luggage. And so what is that part or, uh, of the force? Well, that would be the horizontal component of the force. So. The horizontal component of this force is F cosine of the angle theta. And so by the de definition of work, which I used here, work is done as the product of force and displacement. If I replace the force, um, if the force that is making the, uh, is doing the work and making the luggage move is the X component of F, so that is F cosine of theta multiplied by the displacement S gives me the work done uh, by this force. And so this result here can be 
um, analyzed for different values of the angle theta. So when the angle is zero degrees, that basically means that the force F and the displacement are parallel to each other. So this is the same as the example with the car that I discussed, this example. When the angle between the force and the displacement is 90 degrees, so that is the case where uh, the force is applied vertically up, then the cosine is zero, so there is no work done. So that means that when force is applied to an object perpendicular to the direction of motion of this object, this force does no work. An example of such situation is for an object in uniform circular motion, the centripetal force. The centripetal force does no work when an object is undergoing uniform circular motion. And lastly, it is possible that the object is displacing in one direction, but the force that's applied is in opposite direction. Then the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector would be 180 degrees, which gives us a cosine of negative one. And so then the work done by this force will be negative. So to summarize, when the force vector and the displacement vector are parallel to each other and point in the same direction, the work done is positive, and that is the maximum possible work done by the force. As there is an angle between the displacement vector and the force vector, the work done decreases until the angle between the two becomes 90 degrees. When the angle between the force vector and the displacement is 90 degrees, that means that the cosine of 90 is zero, so therefore no work is done by this force. This will be zero here. And then the angle keeps on increasing until the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector is 180 degrees. In this case, the cosine is equal to negative one, and the work done calculated with this formula will be equal to, um, it will be negative. And by magnitude, we'll have a maximum value as well. So now let's assign some values to the force displacement in the angle in the example with the person pulling on the piece of luggage and let's see what we get as the result for the work done by that force. So the force that is applied is 45 newtons, so 45 newton force. The angle theta is 50 degrees and the displacement S is 75 meters. So we want to calculate the work done by this force F. So by definition, the work done is equal to F times S, but in this case, we only need the X component of the force, so that is F cosine of theta. So F cosine of theta times the displacement gives us 45 newtons times cosine of 50 degrees times 75 meters, or this is 2,170 joules. If the force was in the same direction as the displacement, meaning the angle between the two vectors was zero, then the work done would have been 3,375 newtons. If the force was directed opposite at 180 degrees to the displacement vector, then the work done would have been negative 3,375 newtons. So the difference between the work done as the problem is stated with the angle between the displacement and the force being 50 degrees, this amount of work and the maximum possible work done, that's when the force is parallel to the displacement and the angle between the two is zero. The difference comes from the portion of the force that is per, uh, perpendicular to the displacement. So that is the Y component. So the Y component here does no work. So therefore, um, that's what we get for the work done. So here is an example how the work 
done by a force can be positive or negative depending on the, uh, whether the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector is, is zero degrees or 180 degrees. So we have a weightlifter who is pushing a barbell with weight of 710 newtons up and then he is bringing it down. So to calculate the work done by the weightlifter, we use the definition of work, which is that the work is equal to F S. And so now I also must account for the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. So we multiply this by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So in the first example, uh, or, or the first part of the motion, the weightlifter is pushing the barbell up. So the force that he applies on the barbell is vertically up. The displacement is vertically up. So that means that the angle between the two vectors is zero. And so then F cosine of zero times S is simply equal to F times S. And so if I multiply the force by the displacement, that gives me 462 joules of work. As the bar is being done on the bar, uh, barbell, as the barbell is being pushed up. Now, the barbell is coming down. The force that the weightlifter is applying is the same, pushing up, but the displacement is down. So the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector is 180 degrees. So therefore, we have F cosine of 180 times S. Cosine of 180 is equal to negative 1. So then the work done is equal to minus F times S. So calculating the result here gives us that the work done is negative 462 joules. So the amount of work by magnitude in both uh, parts of the motion is equal to, uh, is the same, but when you account for the actual direction of motion of the barbell, we get two opposite results with opposite signs. So it is very important to Pay attention to um, the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector as you are doing problems. Now let's see how the work done on an object is converted into a kind of energy, which is the energy of motion, also known as kinetic energy. So let's consider a constant net external force acting on an object and the object is displaced a distance s in the same direction as the net force. So the net force acts to the right in this example. The displacement of the object is also to the right. So the work done by this force is the product of the net force and the displacement. And we also know that from Newton's second law, the net force is equal to the product of the mass of the object and its acceleration. So the work done by the net force is equal to ma times s. So let's look at the motion of this object. So initially the object is at some initial position. Then a force f acts on this object. So the object then moves down the straight line and ends up at some other position, which I will call the final position. So at the initial position, let's assume that the object had some initial velocity, vi. And at the final position, the object has a different velocity, v sub f, final velocity. And since there is a force that acts on the object, then that means that the object is accelerating. So there is acceleration A, and the distance that the object is going to travel between the final and the initial position is the displacement, and let's call this S. Okay, 
So we know that there is a, from kinematics, that there is a relationship between the final velocity, the initial velocity, acceleration, and the displacement. And this relationship was given by V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2 times A times S. So from here, I can find an expression for A times S. So from here, A times S is simply equal to V final squared minus V initial squared divided by 2. So then if I substitute in Newton's second law, where the force, I'm um, sorry, the work done by the force W is equal to MA times S and rearrange the terms. I get M times AS. Now I can substitute AS with V final squared minus V initial squared divided by 2. I finally get that the work done by the force is equal to the mass of the object times Vf squared over 2 minus Vi squared over 2. So what I've explained so far is this portion of this derivation. So now when I group the terms, the final uh, velocity and the uh, initial velocity separate, I get the difference of one-half mv final squared and one-half mv initial squared. And those two terms are expression of the kinetic energy of this moving object at those two different positions during the motion, final position and initial position. So, the definition of kinetic energy is that the kinetic energy, Ke, of an object with mass m and the speed v is given by one-half times the mass of the object times the speed of the object to the second power. That is the kinetic energy of the object. As you can see, the kinetic energy depends on the mass and also on the speed to the second power, which means that for an object that is moving twice as fast as before, its kinetic energy will be four times larger. If the object is moving three times as fast, then its kinetic energy will be nine times larger, and so on and so forth. So this square dependence here of the speed is very important. And so the relationship between the work done by a force and the change in kinetic energy of an object is given by the work energy theorem. The work energy theorem states that when a net external force does work on an object, the kinetic energy of the object changes by the amount of work done on it. And this is expressed as the work done on the object is equal to the final kinetic energy of the object minus the initial kinetic energy of the object, or that is one half times m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. So what does that mean? So let's look at this example. So we have this uh, airplane is moving with some initial velocity v0 and then force f is applied to this airplane. The airplane displaces a distance s and at the end of that displacement the velocity of the airplane now is different vf. So I can assign a kinetic energy term associated with the initial position of this airplane and this kinetic energy term is equal to one half m v zero squared and then I can also assign a final kinetic energy associated with the airplane at the final position and that is one half m v final squared and so when the force was applied to the airplane work is done and this work goes towards the change in kinetic energy from the initial value here to its final value here. And so to calculate the work done by this force, we simply must take the difference between the final kinetic energy of the airplane minus the initial kinetic energy of the airplane. Let's look at the following example using the work energy theorem. The mass of the space probe is 474 kilograms and its initial velocity is 275 meters per second. If 56 milli newton force acts on the probe through a displacement of 2.42 times 10 to the 9th meters what is the final speed 
of this space probe. So the space probe has initial velocity V0 of 275 meters per second. The displacement is 2.42 times 10 to the 9th meters. The force acting on the space probe is 56 millinewtons. The question is, what is the final velocity? So we start with the work energy theorem written in this form. The work done by the force is equal to one uh, to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy of the probe, where the work done is calculated as the net force times cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement times the displacement. So the angle between the applied force and the displacement is zero degrees. The two vectors are parallel, pointing in the same direction. So this cosine here will be equal to one. And so here is the calculation. The work done by the force is F cosine of theta times S is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy of the probe. So the force is 56 millinewtons, so that is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 2 newtons times the cosine of zero, the angle between the force and the displacement, times the displacement, which is 2.42 times 10 to the ninth meters. On the right hand side, we have one half times the mass of the probe, 474 kilograms times the final velocity squared, minus one half times the mass of the probe times the initial velocity, 275 meters per second squared. So solving for the final velocity gives us a value of 805 meters per second. Now let's talk about a different type of energy that an object can possess, and that is the gravitational potential energy. So for this example, let's consider this basketball, which is initially a height h0 above ground, and it's let go in a free fall towards ground. So the reason why the ball is falling towards ground is because of the gravitational force due to Earth, and that force presents itself as the weight of the basketball. Okay, so then we have a force that acts on this object, which is the basketball, and the basketball falls a certain distance, so it displaces a certain distance towards ground. And so at some later point of time, the basketball is a distance hf above ground. So from the definition of work done by a force, the work done by the gravitational force here, or um, the weight of the ball, in other words, is equal to force times cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement times the displacement. And um, the work done uh, by the force of gravity will be equal to mg, which is the weight of the ball, times the vertical displacement, which is h0 minus hf. So the example that I stated on the previous slide was for the basketball dropping straight down from its initial position. But the same expression for the work done by the force of gravity applies for the case where the ball is thrown up in the air and then reaches the final position as in the previous example. Why is that? Because from its starting position, the ball goes up in the air and then gets back to its starting position level. So during that portion of the motion, the displacement vertically is zero. And then only the motion from here to here counts as displacement. And so this situation, when the ball thrown up in the air, is exactly the same as the ball starting from the same level and left to free fall towards this final position. So conceptually, there is no difference between the two as far as how we write the expression for the work done by the force of gravity. So here's an example that uses the concept of um, work done by the gravitational force and also kinetic energy. So we have a gymnast that leaves the trampoline at an initial height of 1.2 meters and reaches maximum height of 4.8 meters before falling back down. What is the initial speed of the gymnast? So here is a cartoon of the problem. So the gymnast starts at a height of 1.2 meters above ground with some initial velocity v0. So they jump to a final height of hf, uh, 4.8 meters. And so at that final height, the gymnast is stationary for an instant of time, so no velocity. And then they fall back down towards the trampoline. So 
I can look at the gymnast as an object which is under the action of gravitational force. And so as the gymnast is going up, the gravitational force of the, acting on the gymnast pulls uh, him down. And so this force does work as the gymnast changes, um, displaces vertically from H0 to HF. At the same time, the gymnast also leaves the trampoline with some initial velocity and ends up at, with final velocity of zero at height FH. So that means that the kinetic energy of the gymnast also changed during that motion. So we had some initial value and then some, another final value. So then that means that the gravitational force did work on the gymnast and as a result, gym, the gymnast's kinetic energy changed. So the work done by the force of gravity is equal to the change in kinetic energy, final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. And on another hand, the work done by the force of gravity is equal to mg times h0 minus hf. And so I will set those two equal to each other. And keeping in mind that the final velocity of the gymnast at the highest point is zero, that term here will be equal to zero. So only the second term survives. Then combining the two equations gives me that mg times the vertical displacement h0 minus hf is equal to minus one half mv0 squared. And so from here solving for, for v0, I get that v0 is equal to square root of minus two times g times h0 minus hf. Now I plug in the values of all these variables. So we have minus two times 9.8, and then here we have 1.2 meters minus 4.8 meters. And then I take the square root of that, and the answer is that the initial velocity of the gymnast was 8.4 meters per second. So we already saw that the work done by the force of gravity is equal to mg times h0 minus hf. So I can rewrite that as the difference of two terms, mgh0 minus mghf. And so now I'm ready to state the definition of gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy, Pe, is the energy that an object of mass m has by virtue of its position relative to the surface of the Earth. That position is measured by the height, h, of the object relative to an arbitrary zero level. And so the, the form of the um, equation for the gravitational potential energy is Pe is equal to mgh. The units for the gravitational potential energy are joules, and so are the units for kinetic energy. Why is that? Well, because the work done by the force of gravity is equal to the change in gravitational potential energy. So work is measured in joules, therefore gravitational potential energy is measured in joules as well. Now in regards to the arbitrary zero level, um, what you would do when you do problems is you are going to select from what level you're going to measure the distance to an object above ground, and that selected level you will take to be your zero gravitational potential energy, where this is zero. And everything that is a distance from that selected level will have some gravitational potential energy. Typically, in most problems, the arbitrary zero level is actually the surface of the Earth, so the ground, and so we measure distances from there. However, in general, as long as you define where your zero level is, Again, that is the level where the gravitational potential energy of the object is zero. And you are able to measure distances from that zero level, then you will be able to calculate the gravitational potential energy at any position. Different than that, than that uh, zero level. When objects move under the action of some force, we have two types of forces by the nature of how they do work on objects. We have conservative forces and we have non-conservative forces. So there are two definitions of a conservative force. 
The first definition says that a force is conservative when the work it does on a moving object is independent of the path between the object's initial and final positions. So what does that version of the definition of conservative force mean? So let's take, for example, this ball with mass m. And I want to move this ball from the initial position right here, this initial position, to the final position right here along this path, like that. Okay, so this ball is constantly under the action of the gravitational force, mg. And so as the ball is displacing along the horizontal portion of the path, let's call this distance um, S1, the work done along this portion of the path, W1, by the gravitational force will be mg cosine of theta times S1, which is equal to zero because the angle between the gravitational force and the displacement is 90 degrees, so the cosine is zero. So no work is done by the gravitational force as the bow is displacing along the horizontal portion of the path. And we know that from before because I said that forces that are perpendicular to the displacement have do zero work on the object. Okay, then the ball displaces vertically from here down to the final position. And in this case, the work done by the gravitational force, W2, will be equal to mg cosine of theta, S2, where S2 is the displacement vertically down. And now this is just equal to mg times S2, because the angle between the force uh, and the displacement is zero, and so the cosine of the angle is equal to one. So the vertical portion of the displacement, or the vertical portion of the path here, when it's completed, the gravitational force does a non-zero work. Okay, now let's consider the bow going from the initial position to the final position along a different path. And let's take this different path to be like this. First vertically down and then horizontally to the right. So when the ball is moving vertically down, the length of the path here is S2, just like the other one. So this is S2, so the work done here and let's call this W3 is going to be mg cosine of theta times S2. And since the angle between the gravitational force and the displacement is zero, then the work done is calculated as mg times S2. And after the ball reaches this position right here, then it displaces horizontal to the right. Um, the direction of the gravitational force is at 90 degrees with respect to the displacement, so therefore the work done during this portion of the path is equal to zero. So W4 is equal to mg cosine of theta times S1. S1 is the displacement horizontally, and this is equal to zero. And so now you see that whether the ball is placed from the initial position to the final position, first going horizontally and then vertically down, or first going vertically down and then horizontally to the right, is irrelevant because the work done by the gravitational force is the same. So that is the meaning of the first version of the definition of conservative force. So again, just to repeat, a force is conservative when the work it does on a moving object is independent of the path between the object's initial and final positions. The second version of the definition of a conservative force states that a force is conservative when it does no work on an object moving around a closed path starting and finishing at the same point. 
So let's uh, talk about what the second version of the definition of conservative force means. So let's again consider uh, our ball with mass m starting at this initial position and I will make the ball go to orig initially to the right along this horizontal path then go vertically down after that to the left along this horizontal path and then vertically up back to its initial position. Let's calculate the work done by the gravitational force as the ball moves first to the right, then down, then to the left, and then up. So let's name uh, the displacements at each stage as S1, S2, this one is S1 again, and this one is S2. So for simplicity, I selected this uh, path to be uh, rectangular, but the same considerations can be stated for any shape of the path. So the work done during the first portion of the uh, path, W1 will be equal to mg cosine of theta, times S1, and this is equal to zero because the gravitational force points down and the displacement is perpendicular to the gravitational force, so therefore that cosine here gives us a zero. The second portion of the path, the gravitational force does work W2, which is equal to mg cosine of theta times S2, and this is just equal to mg s2 because the angle between the gravitational force and the displacement which here is down is equal to zero therefore this cosine is equal to one and so we get mg times s2 then the displacement is along the path s1 here but to the left now so the work done during that portion of the, the uh, path is equal to W3, and this is mg cosine of theta times S1. And again, the angle between the gravitational force and the displacement is 90 degrees. So therefore, this work is equal to zero. And finally, the work done as the ball goes up to its initial position along the length of path S2 is W4 is equal to mg cosine of theta times S2. Now the angle theta between the force and the displacement is 180 degrees because the displacement is vertically up, but the force points vertically down. So the angle is 180. So therefore this cosine here will give us minus one. And so the result here is minus mg times S2. So then the net work done during the entire path from the initial position back to it, uh, the net work is just the sum of the four of the works done uh, along the four uh, stages of the path from the initial position back to it. And so this is zero plus MGS2 plus zero minus MGS2, which is zero. So this is possible because the gravitational force is a conservative force. Essentially what this tells us is that along this cloth pa closed path, um, no energy is lost. The assumption here, of course, is that there is no air resistance that acts on the ball. And so here's the list of non -conserv of conservative forces that we are going to see in this uh, course. And for those of you that are taking the second uh, part of the course, uh, some of them are there as well. So we have the gravitational force, we have elastic spring force, and then we have the electric force. 
Now, there is also a set of forces that do not satisfy the two versions of the definition of conservative force. And th therefore, those forces are named non-conservative forces. Examples of non-conservative forces are the static and kinetic friction forces, air resistance, tension, normal force, propulsion force of a rocket. So why is, let's say, the uh, friction force a non-conservative force? Because if you uh, take an object and you move it horizontally from some initial position to some final position, the force of friction is generated between that object and the surface across which that object slides. And so, uh, as a result, if the object is moving with some initial kinetic energy at the initial position, the kinetic energy at the final position will be less because energy is lost during the motion in form of heat. Now, if I take the object from the final position and push it back towards the initial position, the object will not regain the lost amount of energy. It is going to lose more energy because there is friction between the object and the surface. So unlike with conservative forces, non-conservative forces lose energy for the object. And this energy can never be recovered if we return the object to the initial position. And it doesn't matter if it's going to be along different paths or the same path it's still the same effect. So that's why they're called non-conservative forces. They do not conserve the work done on the object. So in uh, normal situations, both conservative and non-conservative forces act simultaneously on an object. So the work done by the net external force can be written as the sum of the work done by the conservative forces and the work done by the non-conservative forces. So again, conservative forces are gravitational force, elastic spring force, um, electric force, and for non-conservative forces, we have static or kinetic friction, normal force, and some others. The most common one that we are going to be dealing with as far as non-conservative forces are concerned is the friction force. So the work done by the external force is equal to the difference between final and initial kinetic energies, or that is also labeled as the change in kinetic energy. On the other hand, the work done by conservative forces is the work done by the gravitational force, so that is the difference between initial and final potential energies, or if I write this in terms of a change of potential energy, that will be the negative of the change in potential energy. So, the work done by a force is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The work done by conservative forces is equal to the negative of the change of potential energy. So, if I substitute that in the work done, in the expression for the work done by the external force, then I get the change in kinetic energy is equal to minus the change in potential energy plus the work done by non-conservative forces. And so, if I rearrange the terms, then I have an expression for the work done by non-conservative forces, and that is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And this is known as the work energy theorem. This is the general expression for the work energy theorem, which can also apply for the situations where there are no non-conservative forces in the problem, such as there is no friction. Then this left side here will be equal to zero, and that will be equal to the change of kinetic energy plus the change of potential energy of the moving object. What that tells us is simply that the sum of kinetic and potential energies at some initial position will be equal to the sum of the kinetic and potential energies at some final position. And so that's what we have here. The work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. So if I write those changes as the difference in final and initial terms, I get kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial plus potential energy final minus potential energy initial. 
then I can group the final energy terms together and the initial energy terms together to get kinetic energy final plus potential energy final plus kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial and this is a typo here so that should be a minus and then I can rename the ter the sums in the parentheses to uh, give them a different letter and so the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to E final minus E initial and so E is the ter the symbol that is used for mechanical energy and the mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy of an object as it's moving. So the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the mechanical energy final minus mechanical energy initial of an object. The mechanical energy of an object E is the sum of its kinetic energy and potential energy. And so, as I stated before, if the net work on an object by non-conservative forces is zero, for example, no friction, then the energy of the object, the mechanical energy of the object doesn't change, and so the final and the initial mechanical energies are equal. So this written in terms of kinetic and potential energies uh, is a very useful tool to calculate various problems where non-conservative forces are not present. So the final mechanical energy is equal to the initial mechanical energy can be written as final kinetic energy plus final potential energy is equal to initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy. And this principle here can be used or this relationship here can be used for problems such as a ball is being tossed in the air and it's falling, you know, it's free falling towards the ground where we have a change in kinetic energy between two values and change in potential energy between two values as the ball is moving and that can be used when there is no friction to solve for either a distance from the ground or a velocity during um, uh, at some point of the motion. So the last equation that I wrote is known as the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. So the total mechanical energy E, which is the kinetic energy plus potential energy of an object, remains constant as the object moves, provided that the net work done by external non-conservative forces is zero. Or in other words, when there is no friction forces or air resistance forces, the mechanical energy E which is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of an object is constant. It doesn't change. So here is a schematic example of this principle. We have a bobsled that is going down an ice path from a certain uh, initial height. And the bobsled starts from rest. So the total mechanical energy of the bobsled is the sum of its kinetic and potential energies. So at the starting position, the kinetic energy is zero because the velocity of the bobsled is zero. But based on the mass and height above ground, it was calculated that the gravitational potential energy is 600,000 joules. So the total mechanical energy is 600,000 joules. As the bobsled reaches this point here, the velocity is such that the kinetic energy is 200,000 joules, but the distance from the ground is less and it corresponds to gravitational potential energy of 400,000 joules. The sum of the two energies is still 600,000 joules. As the bobsled reaches this lower point here, the kinetic energy is 400,000 joules and the gravitational potential energy 200,000 joules. The sum of the two still 600,000 joules. And at ground level, the gravitational potential energy is zero, but the kinetic energy is 600,000 joules. So the total mechanical energy is still 600,000 joules. So as you can see, the kinetic energy values change as the bobsled gets from the highest position to ground level. The gravitational potential energy values also change as the bobsled gets from the initial position to the ground level. 
but the sum of the two terms remains constant at 600,000 joules. So that is uh, an example for the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. At any point during the motion of the bobsled, the total mechanical energy remains constant, even though the two energies, kinetic and potential, may change values as the bobsled is moving. Now let's look at one other important quantity which is related to the concept of work, and that is power. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done and it is obtained by dividing the work by the time required to perform the work. So power is the work divided by time, and this is measured in joules per second, and power has its own unit, and that's the watt. So why do we need power? Because if we consider the concept of work, well, the work done by a force does not tell us how efficient the process was. For example, a person is lifting um, 300 bricks from ground level to one meter above ground. So the work that's going to be done is the work of the force of gravity, which would be the weight of those 300 bricks times the distance moved above ground. Except for this doesn't give us information about how long it took for this work to be done? Did it take one hour? Did it take one day? Did it take one month? Or did it take 10 minutes? But using the concept of power gives us the efficiency with which work was done. So that is work divided by time. Now remember that work was defined as force times displacement. And, of course, we have the cosine of the angle between the displacement and the force vector. So if I substitute that in the expression for power, then I get another valid formula for the power, and that is that the power is equal to Fs divided by T. And let's assume that the angle between the force and the displacement is 0 degrees, so the cosine gives us a value of 1. And then from here, remember that... Displacement divided by time is just equal to velocity. So the power is calculated as also force times displacement divided by time or force times velocity. So this is two other versions of the uh, definition of power based on the definition of work and the definition of velocity. And so here in this table, there are some examples of the power generated during uh, certain activities. So for running at 15 kilometers per hour, 1,340 watts of power is generated. Skiing generates 1,050 watts of power. Biking, 530. Walking at five kilometers per hour, that's 280 watts. And sleeping is 77 watts. And this is for a young 70 kilogram male. The principle of conservation of energy, which I stated in terms of initial kinetic and potential energies added together equal to final kinetic and potential energies added together, essentially applies to any form of energy in the universe. And that is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. So, for example, an object in free fall experiences conversion of its gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. When an object is sliding across a rough surface, the force of friction generates heat, and that's a form of energy. So the kinetic energy of the object decreases by the amount of heat produced because of friction. So the kinetic energy doesn't just vanish, it becomes heat. Then we have an example of, create, of the conversion of the energy that comes from the sun into electricity. And so that's thermal energy that's converted into electricity. And then we have electricity can be converted into thermal energy. You say you are 
using your microwave to heat up some food. Um, electric energy in electromagnetic generators can be converted into magnetic energy and then the magnetic energy back to electric energy. And so with an electromagnetic motor, one could generate electricity. So all these are examples of conversion of energy from one kind into another. And energy is never destroyed or created. It's always in balance. Okay, so this concludes the lecture on uh, work and energy.